Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 665. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is May 28th, 2021. All right, welcome back for another episode. I, I'm going to let you know up front, Kevin is not at 100%. Do I have COVID? No, 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 no. Do I have a cold? Allergies? Flu? No, I think I got food poisoning. I, I ate something yesterday, and the whole system is a little bit out of whack, and so I'm a little tired, a little drained. But because I am a consummate professional, I'm willing to stand here and let you watch me talk sick. That's just going to do it for you. Before we get too far into the show, I please need you to like the show, subscribe to the show, comment on the show, uh, share the show. I mean, word of mouth is the best way to get Anglican Unscripted out there. And I don't mind you guys sending this to Lambeth Palace. I don't mind you sending it to the crazy bishops and the good bishops that are out there. All clergy should watch us. If they don't want to watch us, we have a podcast. We happen to have a way that you can listen to the program without seeing our faces. And that's kind of cool. You'll find that all in the show notes on YouTube. George, um, you are out of your Anglican Unscripted attire again. You're wearing white. What's going on? Uh, well, it's casual Friday. <laughs> it's casual Friday. And I'm working, working from the office, uh -huh. uh, trying to get all set for the weekend. Um, I'm uh, going to be taking a week away and uh, two weeks to go down to a training program for the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Uh, it's being held at a Catholic church on St. John Paul II Road in Ave Maria, Florida. Nice. So if that doesn't sound <laughs> Catholic to you, I don't know what it is. Uh, and so I'm just getting all my uh, everything ready for the week away where I'll be studying with my wife Susan on how to uh, catechize uh, young children in this particular program. We're looking forward to it. It'll be quite exciting. Very needed in our churches. One of the things lacking most in our churches, at least the last three decades, has been catechesis. Um, in my church back in Verona, I think I was the last uh, of the boomers. I guess I'm more of a Gen Xer. I'm at the line who went through catechism at the church. They just stopped doing it. And so it's time to reinvigorate our teaching of our youth. There's a lot going on in the news. We're not going to cover it all, um, but there's sad news. George and I have talked about what's going to happen now that COVID's over. Uh, the people who have left the church or have tried to attend church on Zoom uh, are not going to be habitual in returning to church. And there's a lot of casualties that happened during COVID. It started back in August. You saw small rural church closings. You saw um, diocese putting on emergency notices. What are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about that? And we are to the point now where we're seeing it hit main line large churches. And George, I'm going to talk about Christ Church from Norwich, which is here in Connecticut. I happen to be stationed 23 miles away from uh, Christ Church in Norwich. Uh, this week, and they are going to have their last service at 4 or 4.30 on Sunday after centuries. They're one of the first churches in the diocese here in Connecticut. And yeah, they probably went a little wacky with the liberal stuff, but uh, up till 2008, which is after Gene Robinson, they had a stronger congregation, George. Yes, um, we're seeing uh, changes. For instance, the Church of Ireland is now allowing uh, worship again. South Africa is allowing worship, but limiting it to 50 people or 50% capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, Norwich is in what the state of Connecticut Health Department calls the red zone, which I think means that you have to still have to wear masks and uh, social distance. I'm not quite sure because each state is different. Florida, we've had any zones uh, from the beginning. Yeah, well, um, as a uh, current resident of Connecticut for the next uh, 20 days, the governor lifted the state mandate for mask if you've been vaccinated. So if you've not been vaccinated, you still got to wear a mask. Uh, the churches still have their 25 or 50 percent rule. Uh, and the churches have not decided to have vaccine only sections yet. So, Well, one of the things that we have been saying is that the, on Anglican Inc., 
Anglican Unscripted, is the COVID regulations and the COVID church practices may be a death blow to some churches. And we have an example today. And just I just happened to come across uh, an article in the newspaper about this is the last Sunday for this church. Christ Church was built, founded in 1747. As Kevin said, one of the oldest uh, continuous churches in Connecticut. And its current building was built in 1846. And I looked on the internet and they have a Facebook page and it's not much activity on the Facebook page, but there are no obvious red flags of things that would make me go, ooh, I don't want to go there. I did, uh, um, and seriously, if you look at the pictures, I don't see a rainbow flag hanging over the, a banner over the front door. I don't see uh, the, the, the for sale sign of the LGTBQ. So. And, and, and nor do I see uh, boarded up, uh, it's not an inner city parish in a neighborhood that has gone to the dogs. Mm -hmm. um, now, Norwich is a uh, New England mill town. Uh, and there are one or two other Episcopal churches in the town, one of whom has got two full-time staff clergy, so it's doing okay. But, you know, I just decided I'd look into the uh, statistics. And online is printed the last 10 years, 2008 to 2019. In 2008, they had 253 members. And the same year, they had 116,000 in income, which is pretty low that, for that number of members. That's low for that number, yeah. Now, so I'm thinking, well, maybe they might have inherited money. And if they're that old, there's a good chance. And they had 104 people on average on a Sunday, which is at that time was above the, the mean or the average Episcopal church attendance. So membership and attendance are above average. Income is eh, pretty below average, but that's pledge and plate. They could have something else. The last year for numbers, 2019, they had gone from 253 to 120 members. Their income had fallen to 82,000, and they had 44 people in Sunday on Sunday in church. And that's a tremendous drop in uh, attendance. Now, looking at the numbers, because you know membership really doesn't mean anything, because you can have people who've moved away 25 years ago who've died, and if you don't clean up your records, they're worthless. There are some Episcopal churches, like there are a few in Texas that love to say we're the largest Episcopal church, that we have 5,000 members, of whom 2,000 hadn't been there since they were baptized or married. <laughs> well, I'm not saying this is true about Christ Church, but in 2015, they sort of cleaned their books. They had 200 members in 2015, and 2016, they had 131. That's 100. Nothing really. 80. Nothing. Gone. It, nothing really happened nationally that year mm -hmm. to make a major difference. Now, they may have called a new priest, but even though then it takes a while to, to, to drive people off. So, but looking at attendance, 2015, 82 people down from, 100 and, uh, down from 104, that's 30 people lost in, uh, what's that, seven years? Mm -hmm. And then for the five years, they've lost another uh, 45. And in 2018, they went from 68, then to 44, 2019. And on April 25th, they had a parish meeting and 35 people came via Zoom. So what does that tell us? Before COVID, they had 44 people on a Sunday. In the middle of COVID, still meeting remotely, they had 35. So that's a drop of a quarter or more. And they've all voted unanimously to close the church's doors because they can't make a go of it. And this, uh, without knowing the priest, might have been a fantastic priest, might have been a dreadful priest, I don't know. But we're, we're, I guess where I'm going is, I think we're past the point where the priest really matters. I think we're at the point where demographics, economics, and church worship attendance is going to kill off borderline churches like Christ Church in Norwich because they just won't be able to make a go of it. Not be able. To, you can't pay for a priest on an income of eighty-two thousand and heat the building. Well, I, I must say, a priest always matters. Having gone through many a priest in my uh, thirty-some years now in the Episcopal Anglican world, um, but the churches that did not quickly embrace online making videos being connected online through Facebook and YouTube are the ones who suffered the most. 
uh, I put up the uh, you know how to live, live stream inexpensively uh, day one when everything closed. I said, you as a church need to know how to do this, and you can do it with just the stuff you have lying around. You know, you have an iPhone, you have a, a you, you can do it. And when uh, parts are available in the future, you can buy better systems. Those churches who got online the fastest uh, are going to succeed. Those who had the occasion of Zoom meeting or just had morning prayer um, probably aren't uh, the succeeders. And here's where, you know, they see that leadership through the priest. You know, the priest is willing to do the extra work. Um, my priest has not taken a day off since somewhere in August. And he finally said <laughs> at the at vestry meeting last uh, week, I'm taking two days off uh, until further notice for like you know a month just to to get my life back you know and we're like yes <laughs> you you did fine the whole church staff at our church is amazing in in coming online and they put in the extra hours I think what you're gonna see here is COVID stopping the habitual attenders and once you lose that face that recognition that need to go and have that the emptiness filled uh, by that not desire, need to worship, you know, you, you'll find a, another way to, you, you probably watch CBS Sunday morning. That's how sad it is <laughs> for people who lose the ability to go to church. I've had uh, in the past two weeks, four letters of transfer and families who have joined our church. And in talking to each of them on Sundays, I see a, a common pattern. This may just be purely local to me, but they each watched us online for about six months. And then after we were meeting in person, they didn't come the first month or two. They only came uh, after they had decided, yeah, we like this, we'll explore it further. The old way, what I was taught in seminary is that when you have a visitor, you've got the first seven minutes to catch them. In other words, you you have that hook that's what all the smart people in the books and the seminars that the diocese makes you take say what i'm what i'm arguing is that that's no longer true those first seven minutes are now spent online and that the people you have coming in have already been hooked because if the people who never return uh they've already watched you once they didn't like what they saw um or if they came once and you had some old lady be rude to them in coffee hour, they'll never come back. But the, the way people select churches and do I feel the spirit working here? Do I feel fulfilled? Do I like the people? Do they look like me? Do I feel like I'd be welcome here? Those things that used to take place on that first scouting visit, I think are taking place online. And as Kevin said, that's... Uh, one of the things that uh, needs to be uh, pumped up. Uh, and one of the things I've, I've learned, and I've not really figured out how to do it best, is, you know, my, my worship services basically are me in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I think people like to look at the congregation, yeah. and not just at me for an hour and 15 minutes. Now, we don't have, we don't have a four camera uh, set up with... Uh, a mixing board and a uh, producer uh, we just record it and run with it but well but I also think that's enduring you know people I I've seen some atrocious online services given by uh, you name the denomination there, there's blooper reels everywhere if you go on YouTube but people also find that enduring but they were trying and I loved it. I love the bloopers you know and so yeah you can you can say I need the, the most polished you know, evangelical, uh, name the, the current heretic prosperity gospel guy on the planet. Uh, we need that production. No, 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 no. Your congregation is very forgiving of uh, a growing into it mentality of the technology. Uh, you don't always need the perfect service. And uh, oftentimes I will find people talking about the mistakes of a service and how they got thinking about something. So, and this also is anecdotal and applies to my situation. But in feedback, I'm getting people enjoying the more deep theological sermons than the 
try to tickle your ears and be sweet and loving. In other words, the Joel Osteen type sermons, which I don't give anyway, but my version of the, the Joel smile. Osteen sermon, will smile. Um, other people do it better. And I think people are really looking for something meatier. And uh, I have had people, uh, new and current members of the church, come to me and ask me questions uh, about of a theological nature. I had a lovely little lady of on come up to me the other day and she said, uh, there's a, an ACNA church in the town of Ocala and one of her bridge partners plays, goes to that church Ocala is about a 40 minute drive to the north and she was saying she had gone to an Episcopal church but then the Episcopal church has all these crazy bishops and she even heard a bishop say that uh, there are more ways to heaven than through Jesus Christ Father George is this true? My answer is is it true that they're crazy bishops <laughs> yes, or is it true that there are and in other words here, here's a lady who's been an Episcopalian all her life and is just now discovering who Jack Spong is and why uh, Jack Spong and she says, you know, is there more than one way to Jesus Christ? Is there, more one, is there more than one way to the Father than through Jesus Christ? Now, if it takes Jack Spong to get somebody to ask me that question so I can share the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, thank God for Jack Spong. But the, the world, the, the, how should I describe it? It's becoming a much smaller world. See, our protection down here in Florida was they can be as crazy as they want up in Connecticut or New York or New Hampshire, but that's a 12-hour, 14, 16-hour drive. And, but now uh, they, they have people tell them how bad the Episcopal Church is because they've not experienced it themselves. <laughs> Next topic, re-education camps. Kevin, are you going to talk about critical race theory again? No, even though Lockheed sent all their corporate white managers to uh, critical race theory training <laughs> to shed their whiteness uh, last month, I'm not going to talk about that re-education. Um, if you really step back, and I like stepping back and, and looking at history as a whole and looking right now at the world from the 30,000 foot uh, level, and a lot has happened since I was a young yuppie uh, in the days of the 80s. In the 1980s, China was just a thing that we we're trying to, to get our hands around, negotiate with. Uh, Nixon had just been there a decade before. And so we didn't really understand China. And China had a lot of people, but they were all in the rural com communities. There's just a couple of big small towns. And somewhere in the middle of early 80s, mid 80s, they said, we need to reform this. We have no control of what happens in the rural areas. We have crazy politicians here. We have churches growing here. We have uh, a cult over there. How do we get control? And the decision was made, let's move them all to the cities. Let's take cities that exist, especially along the shoreline and, and the trade routes and build and unlike church planting, <laughs> build and they will come worked in China. And so from, uh, I got one great example here. Uh, Yuying, G-U-I-Y-A-N-G, was a classic example. Uh, in 1980, they only had 900,000 people. But because of the uh, decisions made by the government to build these buildings and, and bring tech college, uh, tech commerce and colleges in they went to 3.4 million they tripled more than tripled in just 20 years and there's now 13 cities with over a million people china has decided the way forward is to have the people where we can see them where we can monitor them if there is a virus outbreak we can shut that city down it's easier than shutting down a rural community and that's what we're going to do and it's worked it, there's now a power structure that China has that America doesn't have, that China has that nobody else has. They have power in money, power in their people, power in their industry, power in their technology. They make the chips that go into our cars and our computers and our batteries and stuff. China is now, for all intents and purposes, the dominant superpower 
on the earth. I know that because I see sports figures kowtow to China. Is that the right word? Yeah. Kowtow to China all the time. Capitulate. I'm sorry that I called Taiwan a country. Kevin's not, but this has been heard by uh, uh, basketball stars and the, the head of the WWF. People who know that the future is not in America, it's not in Europe, it's not in any other country except China. That's where the money and the future growth of all things may or may not be in the future. The church is caught up in the middle. China has an official policy that you are not allowed to worship any god except the head of the state. You can acknowledge Jesus, you can know about Jesus, you can know about uh, theology, stuff like that, but the head of your church, if you have a church, is the head of the Chinese state. George, this is an Anglican story, this is an Episcopal story, it's also a Roman Catholic story. It's a mess. We've been reporting over the past two, three years of the crackdown, starting with, uh, well, specific, uh, the most glaring, of course, is the genocide in against Muslims and Uyghurs, they're mm -hmm. called, in Western China. That's no longer just the stuff of the internet. There are it's, enough uh, escaped uh, prisoners, some of defectors uh, from the security services in China, uh, satellite photos. We know that millions of people are being enslaved. And part of uh, what Kevin mentioned is woke c capitalism, of Lockheed being the latest example. I think it was Disney that uh, threatened Atlanta uh, threatened yeah. the state of Georgia because it uh, was going to have some voting reform laws. Yet Disney filmed a uh, its uh, latest live act, live version of Mulan in, in uh, China, in China, in the region where the uh, Uyghurs are being murdered and sterilized and killed for their body organs by the state. So they have no problem. Uh, with actual genocide, they just don't like Republican legislatures, the Disney Corporation, but I digress. The, in recent years, we've seen uh, the Ten Commandments replaced on the walls of churches of the CCP China Count, Christian Council, Three Self Patriotic Movement, which is the official Protestant church recognized by the state. We've seen the battle between the official Catholic Patriotic Association, which is the official Catholic Church and the Vatican recognized church and the Vatican to their shame uh, have knuckled under and basically uh, thrown their loyalists under the bus saying you have to join the state Catholic Church. Um, we've had the Ten Commandments removed from wall plaques replaced with sayings from Chairman Mao or Chairman Xi. And this week, we're seeing the arrest of clergy again and bishops again, as we saw in the past. Uh, wonderfully named Bishop Giuseppe Zhang. That's cool. Bishop of, of Hebei. Uh -huh. uh, and a dozen priests and seminarians were arrested by, by the police, security services, and accused of brainwashing. Because what were they doing? They were catechizing children children may not be educated in the Christian faith in Florida anymore. In, in Florida. Florida. In, in <laughs> That's <China>. coming. <laughs> in, no, not in Florida. Oh, excuse me. Silly <laughs> mistake. Children may not be catechized in the Christian faith in China. And if you do that, you'll wind up like Bishop Zhang and arrested for brainwashing. Um, it's really bad and it's going to get worse because there's no nothing out there that is willing to sort of stand up to China and say stop. Well, I remember, and this is way back in the days of uh, um, South to South uh, meetings where Archbishop Chu wanted to have a way into China. And either officially or unofficially, he had developed relationships with Chinese and wanted to take Anglicanism into China. I don't have a follow-up to that story. Uh, I don't know if we we certainly a huge underground church in China. I hate to say that because the Chinese are going to go look for, for it. Um, but a visible church in China does not exist anymore. And, you know, Folly is the, the person who invites a co-worker to a Bible study. Or, you know, because they are trained and paid and rewarded for turning each other in. 
China is famous for, in the 1940s and 50s, having children turn in their parents. It doesn't take any time at all to get a co-worker to turn in another co-worker for brainwashing. So. You know, the Anglican Church in China, uh, in the 40s and 50s, after the, after the end of the Civil War in 48, uh, by 56, the foreign missionaries had been expelled and the Anglican bishops, and there was an Anglican church in China that had been there for a hundred plus years. Its bishops have all disappeared into the gulag, the Chinese gulag. Uh, that may be a car warranty you want to answer that. No. <laughs> I've seen your Mercedes, it's time. <laughs> and except one bishop, K.H. Ting, well, I don't want to say apostatized, but he went over and helped form the Three Self-Patriotic Movement, a church free of foreign entanglements, they say. And K.H. Ting became the leader of this first church. He was still an Anglican bishop, but he was essentially a bishop in favor with the government. Fast forward. Um, with the relaxations in the 70s and 80s, and China began its overseas expansion. In the early part of this uh, decade, last 20 odd years, China began a charm offensive in Africa, for instance. So Peter like Akinola and uh, Stanley and Tagali would be brought on, you know, face to face to meet the Chinese state church. And we'd have representatives from the three self patriotic movement attend general convention. And John Chu, Archbishop of Singapore, wanted to sort of reconnect. And the Diocese of Singapore has been engaged in a dialogue, ongoing dialogue with the three self patriotic movement. And in fact, there was a meeting last week held via Zoom between Singapore and the Three Self-Patriotic Movement. And I think the question need be asked is, is Singapore getting in bed with the devil or are they holding out a slender line or reed to an oppressed church? And I can't answer that from my own experiences or knowledge. It's a tough question. Guys, the only way into China is this way. It's the only way. You'll never come to China any other way. Do you take that rich? Uh, even though mm. you know you're uh, sacrificing your morals, you're sacrificing your knowledge of how this is supposed to work. Is it worth taking a chance just to get in the door? And yeah, the, see that it's and it's not because we need to understand that the three self patriotic movement is changing Christian doctrine saying that the Christian faith needs to be relativized to Chinese culture and to Chinese social realities, meaning the party, Communist Party, has the final say on doctrine and discipline. And Kevin, you said we wouldn't get into critical race theory, uh -oh. <laughs> but we have, in essence, coming at it from a different direction, the same underlying Marxist impulse that is behind critical race theory. The and it's the Marxism of Herbert Marcuse and the Frankfurt School and all of that. Uh, we can have Gavin Ashenden um, talk about that too. The cows come home. And it's all true, of course. But the attack on Christianity um, that we're seeing in the West may not be as virulent and open as it is in the East, but it's both heading in the same direction, which is to make it illegitimate or criminalize Christian thinking. We now have it partially in the United States where the Biden administration has uh, undone the, uh, the right of medical workers not to participate in abortions, not to participate in programs that they believe are unethical, fetal stem cell research uh, and abortion. So if you're a doctor in a federal hospital and you have to do an abortion, you can't say, no, I'm not going to do it. If you're a nurse, you, you can. You will be do. fired or disciplined. Oh yes, you will be fired. And there's a case yeah. right now in, in Vermont yeah. where a, uh, a midwife was uh, basically ordered to perform an abortion. She refused and was fired hmm. because the government has lifted that right for you not to participate in something that you believe to be contrary to your faith. Back to thirty thousand feet. Okay, this is where I live. This is this is how I observe the world. Why? Are the young ones so screwed up? Why don't they understand? Well, they were brought up in a completely different time. The last 20, and you know, at least since 1989, have been a safe time here, uh, except for 9-11 and a few minor things. They were not brought up in the time of the Iron Curtain. 
They have no idea about Soviet oppression and that uh, the Soviets were basically housing slaves. You were not allowed to leave the country. They had a fence up all the way around. China, you can't escape. You can get business visas and stuff like that or education stuff to get educated in this country. But these countries keep their citizenry locked in. That's part of Marxism. We need to keep you all on the same page. Okay, that's 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 a key to this. The, the generation, the millennials and the, the Gen Zs and all that, they don't understand that. They don't understand uh, what you and I and people of George's age and my age, which is like 30-something, understand as far as uh, the Cuba crisis. Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, Korea, North Korea. To them, they're learning in school that Marxism's okay, that it's more fair than capitalism. And they're being taught in school that capitalism caused slavery. Capitalism is currently causing racism. And I don't know why I was thinking about this the other night, but currently there is more discrimination in America than there is racism. Discrimination happens you know, to white people, uh, to <clears throat> people my age. What I, I, you know, I'm in my almost my senior years, George. I could not go out and get a young corporate executive job, even though I have all the qualifications. Uh, you know, I could not walk into a Microsoft because, well, you're 55. You know, we can get other people, and that's discrimination. It exists much higher uh, fashion than racism. Racism is real. I'm not going to argue that, but it does not exist like discrimination. And I think part of the the seductiveness of critical race theory is they throw all discrimination in the racism bucket, and they can prove it. You know, this it's not race. That's not discrimination. That's really just racism. Well, first off, these proponents are badly educated. They have an education of sort, but that's not. But that is not included critical thinking of understanding or having any context. Mm -hmm. And so we have these half-educated idiots. And I was a doctoral student. I've met all these people. I, I mean, the old adage that if you can't do something, you go teach. Well, that was true. That's still true. <laughs> the, if the church is not the bulwark where racism is firmly, firmly killed off, that all are one in Christ, either Greek nor Jew, male nor female, slave nor free. If the church starts down that path of choosing winners and losers, then it will have apostatized yet again uh, the, from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in essence, this is, you know, there have been some lines in the sand I've not really, really been able to die over. Our friend Gavin really is hot to trot on the women's orders issue. That's not my issue. I'm not going to die in that ditch. But maybe I should say critical race theory probably is that ditch for me because it upends all that we have tried to do as a society to overcome the darkness of past culture and instead put an even darker Nazi-like culture in its place. There's so many wonderful uh, black economists, Walter Williams and others, who say you know, racism is, is mostly dead. And I, I fully agree with that. The problem is people need a divided society in order to, to further their cause. And their cause right now is to take out me, the white, educated, married, cisgendered, heterosexual, uh, Christian man. I, I added one. Sorry about that. And so uh, to take out George, we are not allowed to have voices. Uh, the whole thing with taking the Lockheed uh, corporate uh, people to this education camp is to say, we don't want to raise up all voices. That's ridiculous. We want that you do not have a voice. If you are white and if you are cisgendered and if you are heterosexual and if you are married and Christian, you have no voice here only the voice of the oppressed and well i thought all people could talk no sorry sorry doesn't work that way so george let's finish up one story we've gone here uh probably a little longer i'm trying to get the clock here 
We did 34 minutes on two stories. Let's finish up with the Winchester story. If you've been watching Anthem Scripted since probably episode 22 or 23, you've heard us talk about the Winchester story. It's not the gun. It's not the rifle. It's not the cowboy movies. It's the, uh, the bishop who did a whole bunch of crazy stuff. I have not had time to completely update myself on the story, and I have food poisoning. I'm half dead right now. I'm going to let George talk about a wonderful article that Gavin put up on uh, Anglican Inc. about this continued sex scandal uh, and lack of accountability in Winchester. Not so much sex. Uh, uh, every every good same, story it, has sex. It's the same. It's the same issue as the sex stories. Uh, but. Tim Dakin is the Bishop of Winchester, and Gavin has detailed how the Diocese of Winchester has reached the point where, for the first time in the Church of England's history, the clergy and people, the Synod, have rebelled against the Bishop and said, look, you got to go. The Church of England has no mechanism for getting rid of bad bishops. And so you can have Dakin, who's not theologically bad, He's just, as Gavin Ashenden calls him in the article, a sociopath. He has destroyed the institution. He's dishonest. He's devious. He's a bastard. Is how those are my words, but uh, that's how I understood it. <laughs> Opinions expressed in any kind of script belong to the uh, co-host. <laughs> and I'm not attempting to engage in long-range psychoanalysis. <laughs> um, but he's a sneaky fellow. Um, I, I had a personal encounter that makes me say that at the GAFCON conference in Nairobi. Was it 2008, Kevin? 2008, yeah. yeah, no, no. Uh, Tim Dakin attended. He was one of the few Eng Church of England bishops to attend. And I took his picture and he asked me not to, to publish his picture or to say that he was there. I remember the until conversation. Af <laughs> until after he basically got back to England to test to see whether this would be popular with his masters. And, of course, he decided he didn't want that picture published. He didn't want to be associated with Gafgon. Now, that, that's, that's his choice. And I could have sort of basically said, eh, I'll do it anyway. But, you know, you sort that, of pick and choose. We, we don't do that anyway. The, the, the reason Anglican Inc. is a step above is we're not there for the global exclusive pictures. So. Galactic exclusive. Galactic, galactic, galactic yes. Yeah. And, 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 but, you know, this is a minor thing. And, hey, you know, maybe the guy just is slippery and he wants to see which way the wind blows and it blew against Gafgon, so he didn't want to be associated with it. Well, Gavin has detailed this man's behavior. Um, specifically, Gavin had firsthand experience of his behavior in the crisis over the Jersey, uh, the island off the coast of France. It's part of England. And the bishop's uh, unlawful and bullying activities um, that culminated in 26, uh, with the Archbishop of Canterbury initially covering for Dakin, and then the Archbishop of Canterbury apologizing for his having covered for Dakin, but well, nothing th happened to Dakin. This goes back to the times of Roland Williams. Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah. If. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, Justin Welby, whom Gavin went to as a representative of the people of the late Synod of Jersey. And Justin Welby, uh, chief of staff, uh, Canon Porter, basically told him to F off. Yeah, in those words, I'm not being uh, melodramatic. Uh, that, you know, we're not going to uh, fight, you know, get rid of a bishop because of you people. Um, well, it's finally reached ahead where the bishop was caught out in lying. Uh, Justin Welby has made a great show of the Church of England no longer having non-disclosure agreements when you have settlements, because these were used to hide abuse and to silence victims and things of that nature. And at the diocesan city in Winchester, it was asked whether the bishop had ever used a non-disclosure agreement. And the bishop's lawyer or somebody, the bishop's representative said, no, we've never used a non-disclosure agreement. And a second follow-up question was asked, have you ever used an agreement like a non-disclosure agreement uh, that would prevent somebody from speaking? And, he, and the answer was, oh yes, we've done that. So in essence, they were parsing it because they, in, because the paragraph heading 
didn't say non-disclosure agreement. It said, you shall not talk about this agreement. Mm -hmm. You didn't have a non-disclosure agreement. And the assistant bishop, the Suffolk Bishop of Basingstoke, along with the senior members of the Synod, went to Justin Well, uh, Ron, Justin Welby, excuse me, and said, look, the guy's a liar. The diocese is bankrupt. And we're going to be presenting this motion at Synod asking him to go. And at this point, Justin Welby threw Dakin over the side. And Dakin was asked to take six months, six weeks to think about his future, which is he doesn't have a future uh, in the diocese. And this, Gav, I encourage you to read the Anglican Inc. story because Gavin summarizes the thing. And, and the thing is, the, the main issue isn't so much the bullying and whatnot, but the failure of the Church of England to be able to police bishops and the failure of the Church of England system of appointing bishops. Dakin has some gaps in his resume that in the United States, if you were applying for a job, people would assume you're in jail. Because, you know, where were you during these six years? Uh, in after jail. you started your career. <laughs> um, the, there's no, uh, you know, we had heard these things before. There's no evidence that Dakin was ever ordained. He was supposedly ordained a deacon and priest at Nairobi Cathedral. Uh, Nairobi Cathedral has no record of this. He didn't attend a theological college. I got, and, but they are very detailed in their documentation. I kind of surprised, you know, Nairobi but, Cathedral. If you've been there, that's a top level cathedral. Yeah, they uh, they they have no record of his ordination. Um, mm -hmm. He's never had a parish job. His father was the principal of a church army college in Nairobi, and after he was ordained, he replaced his father as principal. And one of the first things he did it uh, at uh, Bishop at uh, uh, Carlisle College was to fire everybody and then only rehire back the people who would do what he wanted. 2000, he became the director of the Church Mission Society, moved to England, and he did the same thing. Fired everybody, essentially, and then only brought back those who were on his team. And then he, still without parish experience, was kicked upstairs to become the one of the bishops of one of the five senior sees Winchester in England. And it was rumored that it was because of the influence of his godmother, uh, Lady uh, Brentford. I've heard that name before. Who was a close friend of uh, uh, Mrs. Carey, Lady Carey, um, that he got the job, that he was, in other words, this was an old boy's, old boy's network giving a guy who shouldn't, who didn't have the qualifications for a bishop in the Church of England, one of the senior positions. And he comes into the diocese acting the same way he did at Carlisle College or at uh, the CMS. And now the, it's finally all come back to him. But it, what it does say is that the Church of England system of appointing bishops is hopelessly corrupt. And it, it does not result in a good... When you get a good bishop, it's the exception, not the rule. Now, I have to say the Epi American Episcopal system isn't that much better because we have these search committees that basically are define what they want and they lay down the railroad tracks and they don't give the people in the diocese an opportunity, uh, but rather this is who you're going to ask to be a bishop. You get to choose from black, black, and black, uh, or white, white, and white, gray, 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 green, green, green. You don't get, uh, it's not a system that has been working because the failure of Anglicanism in the modern era has been the failure of the Episcopacy. This is what we see in day. No, I absolutely agree. Um, if you want to look at, you know, just markers of the failure in the Church of England, uh, their inability to pick Christian leadership, not just at the bishop level, at the clergy level. You know, you get somebody who's just going to go the theological route, get that job, uh, end up uh, serving. Oh, they have a new bishop of Rochester. Oh, that should be fun. <laughs> So, you know, we, 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 we shall see what happens. But going back to a 30,000 foot level, how the Church of England chooses bishops and clergy is not identified as a reasonable way to do it in the New Testament. So just and I'm re just reading you talk about, you know, Bishop Dakin that way. Like, how did the Episcopal Church miss this guy? You know, but. I'm just being humorous. Okay, George, that brings us to the end of episode 665. I don't see anything else here that we need to talk about. Uh, anything come to mind for you? 
Yes, I want to respond to something that has been in the comments. The, there's some ongoing jokes about episode 666, and I frankly... Okay, it's a little old right now. Um, I, I know people are attempting to be humorous, and I enjoy the engagement, but that's just not where my humor lays. <laughs> well, you now, by early part of Christianity, boyhood Christian Kevin, 1617... I was I loved that type of the sci-fi part of of my, my Christian walk. The I'm going to read and understand the book of Revelation. I'm gonna watch Hollywood movies on six six six. It was fun, it was a great fantasy at the time, but uh, now that I'm more mature, I'm looking for God, Christ in the kingdom, not evil in the kingdom. If you want to look for evil all day long, it's out there. That's not our job. Our job is to promote and encourage and lead other people into the loving knowledge of Jesus Christ, not into and, understanding Revelation. And and also, maybe this is me, but I've uh, have a, an intense dislike for numerology and Kabbalah oh, and these geez. things that try to uh, find, you know, take Rome. take tr uh, <laughs> to take uh, the scriptures and. Uh, try to find mathematical patterns in them and this and that I, I believe that that is uh, I believe it's a waste of time because I believe that the message of Jesus Christ is absolutely crystal clear and doesn't need to have algorithms drawn from it it's timeless and if anybody if you walk in the streets of Jerusalem and you come upon a merchant a merchant sorry somebody selling coins and he has a coin that says 2000 BC I'm betting it's fake. Just, I'm just going to go out there. <laughs> well, I, I, please don't hear me to say that I'm being critical of it uh, and saying, oh, you shouldn't do it. I mean, do what you want to do. And if, it's, if you find it fun and interesting, go right ahead. Other people do also find it fun and interesting. Uh, it's just I'm not one of those people. <laughs> I used to, I mean, back in the early days, I, I had a completely different understanding of the end times, George. It took uh, more reading of the uh, the fathers of the church to have uh, a, a more clear, not 1980s last days end t la uh, end times uh, theology. So, well, do you want to have Kirk Cameron on right. uh, for next <laughs> next uh, episode 666, where we can do a Left Behind uh, edition? That, that's the book. I I read the first one, and once again, I love the fantasy. I love the fiction. I do. I, well, it's I'll cool. call Tim LaHaye, see if he's free uh, <laughs> on Tuesday. Oh, my gosh. Is he still around? I thought he died. Oh, whatever. No big deal. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 665 of Anglican Unscripted.